without further ado, uh, let me just ask our panelists uh, if they could just briefly uh, share with us um, uh, who they are and, and where they're at in the state. And so, uh, Angela, let's just start with you. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Angie Regan, and I'm the founder and executive director of Welcome Home SIS. Uh, SIS stands for not only our Sisters in Christ, but it's also an acronym for System Impacted Survivors. Uh, we're in Guernsey County, and we're a transitional housing and reentry program for women for System Impacted Survivors. All right. Uh, Angela, thank you very much. And, and let me just say, uh, I know you're a proud OU Bobcat. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you've been at this work for a while. And, and I, I just got to share, uh, uh, her work has been uh, inspiring to me. I just, I found out about uh, uh, your work and the narratives of women's voices uh, as they return. And so the, the other thing I think we should know is um, sort of uh, gender specific responses to this issue. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Our other panelist uh, that's joining us today is uh, Ms. Leanne Pardon. And Leanne, would you go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience? Sure, my name is uh, Leanne Pardon. I'm a pastor. I've been pastoring on the west side of Columbus, Franklin County for about 35 years. And I got involved in uh, women's housing coming from incarceration in 1998. Uh, Ronnie Burks asked me to come and speak to victims awareness and being a victim, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but sitting there listening to them women and knowing that they needed somewhere that they could go, not, not only stability, but structure and accountability. So we founded the Women of Excellence program, which says, uh, I am becoming the woman that God created me to be. And uh, that was part of our goal is to get women uh, to where they understand that they are a mighty creation that God created and God has spe uh, special plans for them. And God's plan was never, ever uh, denied. It sometimes is delayed. And so the whole process was to get them to a place to where they could begin to love themselves again and see uh, their value. Uh, we started in 1998. Uh, we founded um, uh, that home, and uh, for a time, we were able to have the Old Boys and Girls Solution Center downtown. Mm -hmm. They allowed us to have that where we house 50 women at a time. So during all of these years, we have housed uh, a little over 400 women, and our um, success rate was 73%. I had somebody look all this up for me. So uh, I'm I'm excited about what this is going to do for us. Yeah, thank you, Leanne. And let me just say for all of you who are out there, be careful uh, going to visit Leanne at her institution. She'll walk you to death. I think last time <laughs> I was out, out there, we did a we did a 5K and I pulled a hamstring. Um, so, so thank you, Leanne, for, for your introduction. And uh, uh, let me just say, uh, I, again, I'm Mike Davis, and I serve the Department of Rehabilitation and Correction as Religious Services Administrator. So let's go ahead and dive in, ladies, into, into some questions. Um, I'm just going to go off script. I'm going to throw away the paper that I had. I'm just going to just, uh, I want us to be conversational and, and really share with participants today. And uh, Angela, let me just start with you. Um, from from your perspective and and based on your experience, why is it important for people coming home from incarceration to have uh, stable housing? Well, for women, we deal with it, just the women, but um, we've got the gender specific needs, and more women are going to be in recovery. More women are on the mental health case mode and also have their children. Oh, and order a lot of times to get. Just, just one second. I need to just do a, a 20 second timeout. Hey, good morning, everybody. I need you to mute uh, those who are, are joining us. Would you mute your computer? All right. Thank you. All right, Angela, once again. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, in order for these women to get their children back, I mean, they have to have stable housing. And that's foundational to any successful reentry. And any successful life, any productive citizen has a stable, safe home life. Um, and, you know, without without the, the housing, the women, where are they going to go? They're going to go right back to the streets. And that's the same, that's the, what got them in trouble in the first place. They're going to go back to the abusive relationships. They're going to go back to the streets and back to the drugs. Um, so, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the, the foundation of 
a successful reentry. Okay, thank you. It's it's definitely definitely necessary. Like you said, just a just a basic uh, a security housing provides is is necessary. Thank you for that, uh, Leanne. Uh, let me ask you this, um, and, and and I know you shared with us your experiences in providing housing. What is something you feel is needed to help men and women uh, who are returning back to the community from a period of incarceration? I feel like that they need structure and that structure comes from um, program housing and things of that nature that holds them accountable. You know, Mike, they're coming from a structured environment of incarceration and to throw them out there, I say to the wolves, you know, we are, we are saying that that you know that 90 percent of them are going to come back and and that's the reason why the recidivism rate is so high they need that structure so i feel like that the more that uh and i and i i have to say faith-based programming gets involved where uh we can teach them uh that accountability we can teach them how important structure is in in their lives and partnership you know you can't there's there's no lone rangers today we cannot be lone rangers we have got to partner with others it takes all of us as a community to be able to survive and to serve them none of us have the capacity to do it all on our own yeah thank you thank you for sharing that uh and i want to uh that kind of reminds me of something you said a little earlier and, and it brings up um you know the issue of balance what what difference have you seen between uh, those women who are able to come home and find stable housing versus those women who are not able to find uh, stable housing. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm in Guernsey County. Our town mm -hmm. is, is Bosville. It has a population of about 2,200. It's actually a village. Um, and they have a problem that a lot of them get approved for the vouchers, but then there is no housing like um, and, um, Administrator Shelley was talking about. Um, there's no housing and their vouchers are expiring. And I mean, when they're able to get into stable housing, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it sets them on the right path. And I, I mean, I'm not as well as, well as uh, the, the chaplain here, but um, we've been only operating for three years and I've only had 30 women, but we have a zero recidivism rate so far. So, but we've only had 30 people, but that's, I mean, that's tremendous. I mean, I think, um, and you know, I mean, we do find them housing eventually, but it just, I mean, it, it prolongs the progress and a lot of times they want to jump right into it which we don't want them to do that in any way like she said you know it was, they need structure and it, it takes time um so maybe partnering with these other agencies and hud especially mm -hmm. and uh, the housing landlords um is is invaluable crucial yeah yeah thank you and and you mentioned too that the women that are not, unable to find those stable and safe places often they get pulled back into their former life. Is that is that true? Um, well, I haven't seen any like on my part. Okay. Um, I know that they're, they're living with somebody else, and which um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're you know reoffending, mm -hmm. of course. But I mean, it's just not a good environment, and it certainly doesn't mean that they won't. You know, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's hard when you don't when you are trying to strive for independence and you don't have anywhere to go. I mean, they can stay here. My program is as long as they would like to stay, you know, as long as they're following the rules, they can stay as long as they need to. Uh, you know, we don't make anybody stay and we don't kick anybody out. But, um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're all wanting to go and, and live their own life and be independent yeah. and get the kids. And, and it, it's hard. Yeah. Well, thank you for what you're doing. And, and 30 people with uh, safe and stable housing. I just applaud, applaud you for all the work that you're that you're doing, which you've done. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, cha Chaplain, pardon, uh, let, let me ask you this. Um, what do we need to do to get the faith community to be more involved in providing housing for our returning neighbors? I think one of the things that we need to do is we need to um, teach them, train them, that th these women that and men too that are coming out are not a threat. These people are coming out They're They're wanting to change their lives. And so many of them, Mike, when I've talked to them in the past, you know, they said, well, we're afraid, you know, that they, what they're going to do. You don't have to be afraid. I mean, I tell folks all the time, I'm more afraid to go to Kroger than to come to work. Okay. <laughs> so we, we cannot be afraid. 
of of this and they have to embrace these people right where they are and i think that that's one of the major problems you know they are no longer a number but they are a name and we need to address that uh we need to see them as 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 people just like you and i uh, I doubt that there's very many families that are represented out there that has not had someone that has been incarcerated in their family that's now struggling because they're not, you know, they're not taken serious in their, um, um, it, it, even in rebuil- rehabilitation. So churches, churches need to drop that barrier of being afraid. You know, we need to embrace them and have things for them. Um, yeah get involved with their lives yeah it sounds like you're 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 suggesting that that the church should be the church that's right <laughs> the body of christ yeah, yeah. that's right yeah. one person uh, be the body by himself <laughs> yeah that's right that's right we need we need more than just a thumb or a foot we need everybody right to be a to be a part of this and to grasp it uh and so i'm gonna i'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit in front of in front of everybody i know we're on the big screen and we're being broadcast all over and this will be recorded for millions to see in the future. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no pressure, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> but uh, if if you could pick uh, two things for for participants to to focus on to increase safe and stable housing, uh, what what would those things be? Um, the first thing I think would be that we need to, as a society, we need to decrease the stigma. Um, you know, and it's not, it's not it's so easy as to, well, the, you know, we just need to welcome these people because even, I mean, these, I mean, a lot of the churches are, you know, they, they, and the people don't even realize they're doing it. You know, I've taken women to church with me. They all go to church. Um, but I've taken them to church with me and they know that when they go with me, that everybody knows that they're coming from prison. And I've had, you know, members of the church, I introduce them, you know, just like they were my daughter or my friend or whoever. And they say, oh, is that one of the girls that, you know, is in the house? And they don't even acknowledge her, you know, and it's just, it's, it's hurtful to the girls. Um, and I've had, I've had them go to recovery meetings, the, the faith-based recovery meetings. And when people are calling me saying they're on drugs, which I know they weren't, they're drug tested. They're not. It's just, you know, they're they just think that just because they're coming from prison they are they are they're acting a certain way that they are on drugs or you know back to their their old lifestyle or something it's just we need to give them a chance you know um everybody deserves a second chance and sometimes right. three or four or five or as many as it takes right really. right yeah. yeah that's good thank you thank you and i hope i hope uh everybody heard that and 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 you we were taking notes i was i was jotting some things down angela as you were speaking and uh, I'm glad this is being recorded so we can always go back uh, and hear that wisdom. Thank you. Um, Le- you Leanne, I want to... You said two uh, things, but, you know, the stigma is going to cover it all. It's going to cover the yeah. house and everything. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> good. Very good. Let me just uh, hang on a second. Fire. All right, here we go. Think about it. I just want to remind everybody: if if not speaking, if you could mute uh, speaking, that would be extremely helpful. All right, I think we got it. I think we got it. All right, let's try this again. So, so sorry about that, uh, Leanne. I wanted to just just ask you uh, for those who are are listening uh, today. Um, how do they get the, the financial support and the community support to, to provide uh, uh, housing? You know, uh, a lot of this is going to cost money. You have to have property or location. Uh, you have to get the buy-in from people. How do you get uh, a, a person like yourself, a pastor, uh, and the clergy to buy in to lead the congregation in addressing this issue? Now, I'll, I'll ask... Uh, uh, Angela, after she gets done, uh, I just would ask that same question to you. How did you get the buy-in? How did you get the financial support to do what you're doing? Go it's ahead. Not, it's not easy. Um, I will tell you that uh, everybody, uh, the churches will call and ask us to take somebody from their congregation or they know somebody that needs help. 
um, and they're always wanting you to be willing to help. But I will tell you, there's very few of them that step up and help. Um, one of the things that, that I find that is very sad is, you know, we, we know in Matthew, it says when you see, you know, you visited them in prison, you know, and, and my, we think that if we go and do a service in, in prison, we're doing all that we need to do. But we're not we're not making a difference in doing that, uh, per se, just to fill the void in our lives. So uh, we have had fundraisers. Uh, we our ladies ministry of our church has done fundraisers to uh, help with the houses. Uh, we've done a couple of, of different um, type of events that brought uh, funding in um, uh, several years ago. I contacted uh 300 churches within columbus and asked them to let us be one of their um uh, uh benefactors for you know for missions and uh i got response out of 300 i got two and so yeah. it's not easy to do and also you know not not to give people a false hope but if you're in this for the money you better find something else because <laughs> because mm -hmm. there's no money involved well, you're doing it as a ministry, and it is solely ministry. Um, all the years that I have done this, I have never been paid, and uh, mm. so uh, it's it's a mission to me. It's a it's a mission. So um, there is some funding out there, grant wise, um, but you have to get on board with those. And um, I know that you sent me a couple and several ones uh, we have received from some of the local banks. I will tell you that some of the local banks are some of the greatest ones. Uh, they will uh, take your calls and, and they'll use it as a sponsorship. So there's not, church-wise, mm -hmm. not a lot of people get involved. Yeah, yeah. It's good to know that we can we can turn to the banking community. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, and it, I don't know about the rest of you all listening, but it's a little disappointing that only two churches out of 300 would, out of would 300. respond. Yeah. Yeah, Angela, let me, let me ask you the same question. How how are you able to, to sort of support this work and any advice for other people who are trying to do the same thing? Um, well, you got to pray. You got to pray. <laughs> pray. Um, and I get mostly grants, um, and I'm, we're lucky enough to get at least $25,000 to $30,000 a year for grants. And the banks, she's right, the banks, uh, People's Bank and Huntington Bank support us. Presbyterian Women um, they do, I, I wrote a grant today, I mean, they have supported us too. Um, but yeah, as far as the churches go, I mean, we, sometimes we take up collections or the churches will take up a collection, but other than that, um, yeah, it's not too much there, you know, or they, they see, I mean, and I even had a, a church that the women, you know, they saw the women and it didn't, you know, and they were going to them and saying certain things about why, well, cause they didn't want to follow the rules basically. Mm -hmm. But then they just didn't want to support the organization anymore because the women, you know, had relapsed or whatever, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just private donations and grants is where we get our funding. And that's that's not a lot. I mean, we don't get any government funding. Uh, mm -hmm. We just we actually just signed on. We were a level, level two recovery house as well. But the Adams Board helps us out when we have a woman that um, – is you know in recovery so she can be coming because the, the two qualifications for the program are she has to have a criminal record and be in recovery so she could technically be coming from an in, inpatient rehab as well because um, we're trying to open you know the doors for as many women that need housing because uh, i've got a, a lot of room i always have room and if i don't have room i'll make room mm -hmm. um so i don't want to like deny anybody because i mean even when i have room so um in the ctp program um, that's something that we were just made aware of and with a community transitions program. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just working with, you know, you guys kind of on that and, um, and, and they're helping us out and that, that's basically it. But the churches, the churches need to step up and be the body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. And, and, uh, you know, mentioning that, that, uh, uh, the, the, the body of Christ has to be more involved. Faith communities have to, uh, to be more supportive. I'm, I'm reminded of a, a quote from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. who said, it, you know, that the, the faith community needs to be the moral guardians of our, of our communities. And, and so there, there are things that we need to step up and do. Mm -hmm. uh, Angela, in keeping with that comment about the body of Christ, um, what else 
needs to be done in this area that you just can't do alone? And I wanted to ask both of you uh, uh, that question. Angela, after you answer, then uh, Leanne, if you would pick that same thing up. So what else needs to be done, Angela, uh, in this area that you just can't do alone? We need volunteers. I mean, I'm sure I speak for every nonprofit out there. We need volunteers. And the body of Christ is not all, you know, one talent. It's you got the arms, you got the legs. Everybody's good at, at something and not everybody's good at everything or, you know, just one talent. Um, so, I mean, we just, the volunteers, we need, I need board members. Um, you know, if you want to be on the board, Mike, <laughs> <laughs> or chaplain. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank, and thank funding, you. Yeah, and thank you. yeah, yeah. We all have to be in it together, right? We all yeah. we all need to be supportive. Uh, uh, Chaplain Parter, what what do you think about that? What else needs to be done that you just can't do alone? Well, we partner with um, uh, Impact for uh, them helping the women to do resumes to get themselves uh, involved. Uh, you know, involved, in some you know, kind of. Some um, kind of um, uh, employment or something of that nature. So I'm grateful for impact of being a part of that. But we also, you know, I, I agree with Angela. Mentorship is a big thing. I can't, I can't spend all that time with every woman, you know, and so we need mentors that will give of their time and not just once. These women need somebody active in their lives all the time. You know, they need, they need encouragement from them. They need somebody that will give them that hand up. It, it doesn't have to be a handout. A hand up is, is just as vital. Uh, they need that. They also need acceptance. They know that they've just they've been incarcerated. They know that they have been an addict. They don't need somebody reminding them of that all the time, but they need somebody that will be an encourager that will help them to see their value and, and their productivity. You know, give them a pat on the back. That's one of the major things and, and helpers. You know, I don't know about Angela, but it's hard to get uh, five women to three different appointments every day, you know, and uh, some of them, I don't want them to go on the bus. I'll just be honest with you. I don't want them on the bus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need people like that. Yeah. He yeah. was talking about like the transportation and stuff. When we pick up, we try to pick up the women from prison because, if, you know, they put them on the bus. There's predators that are waiting at the Columbus bus station for these women. And they can mm -hmm. spot them a mile away, you know, in their state, um, you know, sweatsuits. They spot them a mile away. <laughs> see that you know, that gate pay. And, and it is sad that we have people like that. But, you know, I try to catch them right when they come out of the gate, but I can't always be there. I can't always, I'm transporting, you know, from the prison then, you know, I've got the women in the house that are not, you know, um, being taken care of or being looked after. And then, you know, also the J pay, um, cause we do outreach or, or I do the outreach myself. I mean, that's, that's pretty simple stuff, but it's time consuming. And, you know, we need volunteers for that. I mean, it's something. I mean, the body of Christ, you know, everybody's good at something. We'll find something for you. That's right. Very good. Uh, thank you, ladies. And, and, and you guys uh, sort of touched on this, but I want to I want to just uh, have you explore a little more um, talking about the community. Now, uh, you know, working for DRC, Chaplain Part, as you mentioned, and and uh, uh, Ronette Burks Trousdale mentioned, all the things that are going on inside and, mm -hmm. and so we have a lot going on inside and but we're 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 lacking that same level of commitment outside or at least the same sort of responsiveness outside what what are some of the things that uh the community can do to help support this effort what kind of role should they play and, and chaplain part i'll start with you but angela i'd really like for you to weigh in on that same question what is our role out here in the community? You know, we need to be resourceful. Um, I know, you know, that there is the uh, reentry programs that are going on that, you know, that the, the incarcerated are being told of what's available, but we need some kind of resource that uh, will help these folks when they get out. You know, I, I, I was just sharing with somebody the other day, I can remember a time when nobody, you know, could get the $7, and that's back years ago, to even get an ID. Well, today we have some resources. There's the join, there's uh, um, 
compass program. There are several churches that will give them a voucher for that. But nobody is getting this all this together, Mike, so that these folks can have this available to them. And once it's available, they've got to know exactly what to ask for, because nobody's just going to go out here and say, hey, you know, I, what do you need? Another thing is they need to know where these community clothing banks are. They need to know where uh, the community food banks are. Uh, some of them are not coming out to uh, these resources. So there needs to be a resource bank that's set up somehow that uh, these folks can get to. And we as uh, running these houses and things. These things need to be available to us and updated and given to us. It's hard for us to go out and search for these things, but if there was a way that they would be automatically sent to us, emailed to us, nobody knows what that would mean. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Angela, let me just ask you the same question. What, what role does the community play? What do we need from those listening and, and from those uh, uh, neighbors and members of the faith community, uh, what, do, what do we need from them um, to help us? Well, we do, I mentioned the Presbyterian women earlier, but we do partner with um, Harvest Christian Fellowship and they have the Harvest House where these women can go and they supplied a lot of this stuff for this, you know, the first house that we had, um, as far as like toasters, vacuums, things like that. Um, and when the women, every new woman is released, we can, can take her shopping there. And she can get her clothes and, you know, because they don't like always like what I pick out for them to figure. So they can pick out their own clothes. But, I mean, yeah, and resources and just acceptance, you know. I mean, we, and we need help. We can't do it alone. And, um, and I, I think acceptance is the biggest thing. Um, it's hard to find the resources, though, like she said. I mean, we pay for their, their, um, their IDs, and it was hard to get their Social Security cards because of COVID and everything was closed. But they're opening back, or not everything, but the Social Security office is closed. So we're getting that, you know, all together. And But we pay for their IDs and, and things. But, I mean, that's an expense, you know. And when you're just on, you know, private donations and a few grants, then, you know, it, it, that $10 adds up. But they are, you know, they can um, trade, you know, trade their prison ID in. Because, like I said, there's not, they're not a number anymore. We want to give these women back their dignity. And nobody right. wants to go to a job interview with a prison ID, you know, you don't, you want to get your ID in, we, we're, we're happy to pay for that. So, yeah, so. yeah thank you. Thank you, uh, ladies, both. Um, re really quick, I, I just want to sort of do a commercial for, for Relink, and, and that was mentioned earlier, uh, and, but I, I want to share with everybody listening that Relink is only as good as the information that is submitted to it. And so if you've not uh, put in information about uh, your clothing resources or housing resources or our, our food ministries, I would encourage you to go to uh, relink.org and register your organization so that uh, when uh, Angela and Leanne are, are looking up resources for uh, their uh, clients, uh, they're able to direct them to uh, some, of those, uh, some of those resources. Um, let me ask you another another question in Dan Rather mode here. Remember remember him, Dan Rather? <laughs> <clears throat> Tell my age now. <laughs> <laughs> Yours too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so so what are you guys personally, and I'll just let whoever like to jump in on this, what are you guys doing to to help um, expand uh, you know safe and affordable housing uh, for people coming home to prison. I know what you're, you're currently doing, but it sounds like the need is so great that we have to expand. Uh, Angela, you mentioned earlier, sometimes uh, you, you might not have a bed for somebody. Leanne, I know that's, a, that's an ongoing challenge. What, what are you up to to expand um, uh, affordable housing, safe housing, and what do you recommend we do uh, what can I do uh, to help expand uh, housing for our neighbors? You know, Mike, one of the things, and as you said that, it come back to my mind, but uh, one of the things that I think that we are lacking in, and, and, and it's such a sad thing, is I call it forever housing for our elderly that is coming out of prison. We have women at, that are coming out that are in their 60s and 
um, they're scared, you know, and if, you know, it wouldn't it be an awesome thing that one of these boarded up apartment buildings that has maybe even five to seven or eight units in it could be used for forever housing for these ladies. And uh, three women come to, in particular to my mind from ORW that I feel like will be out in one from DCI in the next couple of years. And that is their biggest concern. They have no family left. They've been there 40 plus years and they have no family left. Forever housing, you know, uh, something that they can go to that they don't have to worry about having to move. You know, our program is six months to a year, uh, but they need something that goes beyond that, you know, and uh, we got men the same way. I mean, I hate to say it, but, you know, we, we lack in that area drastically to offer something to these folks. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, Angela, go ahead and, and, and uh, uh, launch into that too. What, what, uh, what is, are, are you doing to expand First housing? All, what can you, guys, we do? can you guys imagine being terrified to leave prison? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, that's, that's awful for us, you know, on the outside to be, to think of, I mean, these, these women and men are terrified to leave prison because this is the, that's where they're safe at now, and there's no work for them to go. Um, we recently expanded. We went through a, from a thousand square foot double wide to a 5,800 square foot home, um, and the funding was not really there. <laughs> but I mean, I, I've got to have it, you know. So I mean, we're just I'm just doing whatever I can. I, I also wanted to thank Care Source because we did get a grant from them this year. So I know that that's the sponsor of this program. So. Um, yeah, I mean, and we need to, I need to, I would like to work more with HUD. HUD, um, if we could do, I mean, I, like, like Leanne, I've got the independent housing. I was going to buy several houses for the forever homes or the independent housing for these women to go after they maybe completed this program here. And, but it still would be like just one or two women per, per home. And HUD doesn't do the shared housing. Um, and I think we all need to get on the same page with everything. The HUD office here was telling me that they didn't get those 70,000 vouchers and that, and it's some of them, some of the caseworkers approve felons, some of them don't. Some of them say, well, it can't be a drug charge. Some of them say, well, if they've been through treatment. So, you know, and you never know when your woman fills out the application and it really just depends on who's looking at her application, whether she gets approved or not. And that's, that's not right. And it's sad, but. Um, that's how it is in this county, and um, I guess they, they didn't get, they were overlooked, or, or I was told, um, with the 70, that, but I couldn't take them anyway, because it's a shared housing, they share the, you know, the refrigerator and the stove and the, the kitchen, basically, in the common living area. Um, but for right now, I mean, that's all they got, you know. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Angela, thank you, Leanne, for, for sharing. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, I think about uh, with all of this, and you all have uh, have alluded to it, and you really shared with us uh, the need for uh, the community to respond, the need for uh, churches, mosques, temples, uh, uh, people of the community of faith uh, to respond. And and I wonder if, uh, uh, and I'll let whoever would like to lead off on this question go ahead and take it, and and I'll pose it to both of you. But what are some of the essential connections? So for somebody getting into this work of providing housing, what are some of the essential partnerships uh, that you believe someone would need to make uh, to, be, to be successful in this work? Well, I'm, I, go ahead, Angela. I was just gonna say like your county, um, you know, the, the ODRC, I mean, I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for, for helping us and supporting us but the county also needs to be on board like the sheriff's department the probation officers um you know all of this and, and there's a lot of these women that get released from from the odrc from prison they are they have warrants a lot of them have outstanding warrants you know and they're it's not settled while they're in prison so the county will pick them up and then when the county picks them up it's like then they 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 lose their gate pay they they can't get their stuff whatever stuff they've accumulated during prison, which is, you know, just letters, sentimental stuff, unless they have an address to ship it to, and they have to, you know, they pay for that. But the, then the county just like drops them, I mean, just sets them out. They, you know, they usually get released on their own recognizance. 
um, and then they're released. And then we have to, you know, we do drive, you know, two or three hours wherever they're at to go get them. And I'm lucky if I get that call. You know, a lot of these women, they don't ever call me and I never hear from them again. But, you know, I mean, I just praise God that we are, that we have gotten, you know, several calls from the women that are um, in the county and we can, you know, try to help them. But, um, yeah, we just, I mean, we need to support the community and the, the government, um, mm-hmm. you know, the sheriff's department, the probation officers and things like that. And other nonprofits in the area, the, the, um, the other facilities are not facilities, the ones that provide the mental health. Um, kids, I mean, it's like, it's, it's sad also that it's like, it seems like it's a competition in a nonprofit game, and it shouldn't mm. be. We're all on the mm. same team. We really are, you know? Um, so just, just, yeah, let's just be a team. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and like you said, there's too much, too much competition and too much being siloed off. Um, Thank you for that. Leanne, I, I just posed the same question to you. To, to, to be successful in this area, if we're just, we're just starting out, what are some of the essential uh, connections we have to make uh, in, the, in the community? I agree with Angela with, you know, know your, know your probation department well introduce yourself that's one thing that i did early on is i introduced myself to the probation department and uh they got on board with women of excellence and uh then also you know know your insurance uh liabilities with your housing because you know if they don't allow you to take sex offenders they can shut you down so know what you're doing you know um make sure that you have researched all of those things we partnered with lower lights uh lower lights is a one-stop shop you know they are a dentist a doctor an eye doctor um uh, mental health and uh so i went and, and talked to them and got our ladies involved with them that as soon as they get out within uh two weeks they're they're taken there so that their medication is not stopped and and those kind of things you know and uh i agree with angela about them picking them up and taking them someplace else i literally got a call from uh kentucky that i had uh two hours to get there to get this woman or they was going to uh put her back in jail I couldn't get there in two hours, but I called somebody else and uh, they called them and told them they had to hold her and let me get her. So, I mean, we can, we have a lot of emotional um, uh, uh, ties with these women, you know, and uh, these men. So we have to, you know, we need whatever connection we can get, but know your community and what they, uh, what they expect out of you. Do your, um, um, your um, inspections, your fire inspections, and all of those things. Show them that you're on the up and up. You know, be transparent uh, with your community. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's uh, it's uh, like you said, we all have to be engaged and involved. We all have to to recognize the uh, the significance of the need uh, for for safe and stable housing and the consequences of not having it. Are, are fairly uh, dire. Um, we, we're fortunate today. I, I see one of our, our uh, colleagues, uh, Leanne on here, Miss Miss Wainwright, and, and some <laughs> other names I recognize. I wanna give uh, our audience a chance. If you have a question, uh, please feel free to type it, type it in the chat and I'll, I'll work it in somehow. Uh, Leanne, go ahead, you were about to say Mike, something. One more thing that's really important, and I'm sure that Angela has run into this, but wherever you are housing these uh, folks, you know, they, these ladies and men are so important to us, but know that they are in a community. I personally walked my community, shared with them what we were doing in, in those houses, in those communities, and gave them my personal phone number that if any they saw anything out of line or out of character, that they would call me. And I'm telling you, I had the greatest eyes in my uh, neighborhood. I had people that they'd say, hey, you might as well get over here. You got somebody going out the back door and there's a car waiting on them and just different things. And they helped me to police my ladies, <laughs> you know, so I, I was grateful, but get your, you know, your, your neighborhood involved, let them know that you're not there to um, cause problems, but you want them to be a help. 
But I just want to say, Mike, you know, I take the girls to the city council meetings. They meet the mayor. They meet the chief of police. Yeah. Um, you know, and a lot of them don't want to meet the chief of police. But, you know, hey, he's, he's a good guy. Um, they get registered to vote. You know, you don't have to vote, but you're going to be registered if you want to vote. Um, just, yeah, just things like that. I introduce them to the pastors and, and people at church and mm-hmm. just get them out there. And we had the last house that we lived at. We had a gala last year and I handed out invitations. I put one on her door, our neighbor. And a couple of days later, I said, did you get the invitation? She said, oh, that was from you. I'm like, yeah, you didn't know what we do over here. And she said, no, I never even see anybody there. And it's like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You don't even know that we're here. You know, and yet everybody else in the community is causing an uproar, you know, a disruptive or whatever, you know what I mean? But they, we get up and go to work just like everybody else. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Thank you. So, so earlier on, Angela mentioned uh, uh, the issue of stigma. And, um, you know, the, the state of Ohio has a, a series of commercials, uh, Beat the Stigma. Uh, and they also have one of my all time favorites, uh, Don't Live in Denial, Ohio, right? And and so in, in keeping with those thoughts, what are what are some of the uh, myths, uh, the myths that people have about uh, men and women coming back from prison? What do we need to stop doing uh, in this area relative to our returning neighbors? They have that it's the myth that they want to go right back to prison. They don't want to go back to prison. You know, they're not going to they're not coming home to get in trouble again or commit, you know, crimes. That's not what, I mean, people, and all of these women that I talk to when they're incarcerated, you know, I talk to them via JPay, and sometimes we interview, you know, with a case manager, but, you know, they have really, really good hearts and they, they want to make a change. They want to change their lives. They want everything, you know, to be different. They, they're willing to work for it. Um, but yeah, we just, I mean, the stigma of like people, the criminals, you know, that's, that's a bad name too. Criminals or offenders. Um, you know, we constantly are trying to change the language like we were formerly incarcerated. Now we're, I'm trying to say, you know, system impacted survivors because they survived the system um, and they want to continue surviving and, and their children are survivors too, you know? And, and so, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it's just this stigma. Yeah. I don't know how to break it, but it's just yeah. something that's been going on for generations and generations, you know, and we keep trying to change the language, but it's still the same thing really, you know, until we get people to get with the program. And I don't really know anybody that's not, that not a criminal. I mean, how do you define a criminal? Somebody who's broke the law. Has anybody ever sped or not wore their seatbelt? That's a crime, right? I mean, so we're really all criminals unless, I mean, it depends on who's defining the law. So, and I think, I mean, a lot of people would admit that they, I mean, I know, I, I mean, I could be right where these women are myself personally. I could be there, you know, I'm by the grace of God. Um, I'm not, and I'm able to do what I'm doing to, for the ones that were, but I'm no different. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And, and uh, Michelle mentioned, you know, there's, there, there are biases we have against people who, who have been incarcerated and are coming home. And, and we're very judgmental, which, which is odd because, you know, especially from the faith perspective, uh, we, we, we shouldn't be. Uh, Leanne, what are some of the myths that you've dealt with and what are some things that we're doing we need to stop doing or you know what what else do we need to do um in this area you know mike one of my biggest pet peeves is uh somebody will say oh are those one of those are they one of those people one of those people what's what's one of those people you know right now right then you're saying that you don't believe that they can change and you've i've heard people say well once a thief always a thief or once an addict always an addict that is not true Uh, and i agree with angela but by the grace of god i could have i could have been any one of these women uh so you know we need to stop that um we 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 need to think you know about things you know several years ago when i was at franklin pre-release with the women uh i was walking across the yard and two of the women were arguing and just for a minute my mind went there and man the 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 holy spirit said one moment can change your life take two think it through and now i have it on the wall here at the chapel you know and and every one of us has had that one moment that we could have acted out of that moment but thank God we did think about it and we stopped ourselves. Well, not everybody's had the opportunity to do that. 
-hmm. We need to stop calling them these people. They are a child of God, just like we are created for the the greater purpose. And, um, you know, I have, I, I have to sometimes, you know, I'll see somebody that's, you know, uh, reoffended, and even you know me being a chaplain here at Madison, they'll come in my in my office, and I'll say, "What are you doing here?" You know, and they said, "Well, you know, I just got caught up in it." You know, and I sit them down right then, and I say, "Listen, let's let's backtrack and see what caused that." You know, don't don't sit there and judge them. Let's try to find out what keeps causing them to do those same acts again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when we say that their thieves are always thieves, then we're limiting God to That's right. to change. We're putting a limit on our God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, another myth is women aren't criminals. I, I was shocked when I was a graduate student and I started researching this. It's like women are the fastest growing prison population nationwide mm-hmm. and in Ohio. They're being incarcerated at twice the rate of men. And, you know, before I, I, was, I actually studied mass incarceration. But I had no idea that it was, it was women because they're almost like a hidden population. You know, you don't think about it. Um, women is, you know, criminals. I mean, you put a, mother, a, a woman in prison, they're mothers. You know, how do you do that? Um, yeah, but I mean, uh, it's just, it's horrible what's, what's going on in our society. But, you know, we just got to be more accepting when they, when they get out. You know, women need their babies. So we got to give them that, you know, that dignity of becoming a mother again. And if they are able to. Um, and just welcome them back, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, Angela, this is, this is fantastic. You, you mentioned something that, uh, was actually on my mind to talk about, and that was, uh, sort of the, the incarceration trends that, that women are being incarcerated at unprecedented rates. Right. And, uh, and it brings up, uh, the issue of children. And there have been, uh, several studies conducted in the past that if you have a, if you're a child of an incarcerated parent, uh, you know, the, the likelihood of you experiencing incarceration is increased. And, and I just wondered, um, in your experiences, uh, uh, how important is, is providing stable housing? How important is it to the uh, role of motherhood uh, in our community? That would help us break the cycle, Mike. I mean, we've got to, it's a generational trauma that happens to these kids that when their parents are incarcerated and, and are incarcerated, and there's only two women, I believe, that I can think of right offhand that didn't have a parent that was or a mother that was incarcerated or in active addiction. Two women out of the 30. Um, that's substantial, you know. So they ended up in, in prison. And and some of these women, they go like, "Oh, I liked it." And these guys like, "What do you mean you liked it? You know, we don't want you to like it." Mm-hmm. You know, um, and they have kids that you know some of them do have kids and they're incarcerated, they're in jail, they're continuing the cycle. Um, but with the young kids, I mean, we got to break the cycle. I mean, it's sexual trauma, then it's self-medication, and then it's incarceration, you know, mm-hmm. and then it just goes on to affect the kids. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Leanne, you want to weigh in on that? Yes. You know, um, I was just sitting here thinking of when I was, a, you know, a, the chaplain at ORW that, you know, that we had generations. We had at one time a, a mother and a daughter serving time at the same time. And uh, I think about that and I think about, you know, that how that uh, uh, the community, the community needs to embrace um, a family. You know, that's one of one of the things that we're not seeing right now. We're not seeing a lot of 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 communities embracing family activities. They're either just embracing the children or they're just embracing the the the, the parent. But we need interaction between uh, our children and the parents, you know, and it to be in a way that they are being taught how to be those good parents mm-hmm. and those children, you know, growing up to be uh, mighty and powerful, you know, adults. And uh, it can only come with, with proper training. A lot of those that are in prison today will tell you that they never really had a hands-on mother or father. Uh, they were passed down from mother to grandmother to aunt or whatever, and there was never a constant in their life. So somebody has to step up and show some consistency in what we're doing today. And I think that that's a major problem with our parenting today. We're doing Malachi dads here at at, mm-hmm. uh, at uh, Madison. And I'm telling you, these men are, are finding out that it's it, anybody can be a father, okay? But it mm-hmm. takes a real man to step up and be a, a, a dad. 
and it's the same way with the mothers, you know. And I have to commend ORW for their nursery and uh, toddler programs because they are awesome. But, you know, these women didn't have that outside. So um, we need parenting skills. We're, we're, we're at a loss for parenting skills today. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that and, and talking about the dads because the, the housing situation affects fatherhood uh, fatherhood it does. also it the, does. The, mm. yeah the rip the ripple effects uh related to to employment i mean if you don't have uh, uh, uh an address um you know how do you how do you get how do you get hired and so uh there are all these ripple effects that that we see and so i i guess uh ladies um as we sort of get to the point where we're getting ready to to wind down uh let me let me ask you this um you talked about uh, the possibility of finding grant funding out there. Um, uh, where, where, do, where do we look uh, to find grants to support uh, housing efforts for men and women uh, returning back to the community? Um, I have a partner serving USA. They're out of California and they also, they're the partners, you know, they, it's not just about funding for them. So they give us, they've given us like marketing, I'm a marketing resource, somebody that will give us training and help us with the marketing. And so there's a website that I'm that I have a membership to that they have. Well, they have a membership to that I go on and I look for grants. Um, and and I write proposals. And I've never done anything like this in my life before. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's it's crazy, but you know, God's thrown this on me, and it's like He doesn't call the qual or He doesn't call He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. So <laughs> yeah, like I mean, and I just you know the the banks and things like like. Um, like Lee Ann said, I mean, are a great resource. Um, we have a Get Fresh Garden that it seems like everybody's wanting to fund. You know, that's idea of, you know, women in transition getting, you know, learning self-sustainability. But they, a lot of people don't want to fund a transitional house. Just like, we've well, got to fund the house that's on the garden. So, but. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And, and Lee what has been your experience in, in the hunt for, for funds? Well, the Columbus Foundation is one here in Columbus that, um, but that's, I think once a year they do that. And then there's also, um, there, there was a reentry program here, but, um, they have since, you know, just went up, they're not even doing anything anymore. So it's, it's really hard sometimes to find grants, um, uh, as I said before, you know, sometimes they'll pass through uh, ODRC and you guys will pass them on to us, you know, and we do that. But uh, Ang Angela said something right there, too. You got to know how to write a grant and you've got to have somebody on board that has that capability. And I will tell you, I am not a grant writer. I'm a pastor and I'm a chaplain, but I cannot write grants. So, you know, the, the two that we have gotten, uh, somebody outside wrote those and, uh, and they were very good at it, you know. So the, during COVID, uh, one of the major things that I saw was a lot of people just stopped doing any kind of, of nonprofit work, you know, because everything else was needy. So hopefully we'll see that uh, rebound in 2023 and we'll begin to see more grants available. Faith-based grants are one of the hardest to find though. Um, I was turned down on too because I fail, I will not compromise what we are. We are a faith-based program and I'll not say that we're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you ladies for, for sharing this. Now, uh, as, as we get ready to wrap up, I want to remind uh, our participants, if you have any any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And also, if you'd like to talk to our panelists uh, post-workshop, you can find them through Whova and communicate to them uh, uh, via uh, that platform, which is one of my favorite parts of this uh, 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 platform is the ability for us to connect. Uh, you all both talked about um, uh, the importance uh, the priority that this needs to have, but you've also talked about how how difficult uh, this work can be. And I just want to ask you, just bluntly, is it is it worth it? Has it has it been worth it? Both of you collectively have have done this for a long time, and, and I just want to ask you, is, has it been worth it? When you get that one girl, that one woman, you know, it just it has to be one. You know, Jesus left the ninety nine to go for the one, right? So, I mean, just even one woman, and I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but 
I mean, it's a, it's a lot. It, it changes things. And, yeah, I mean, it's been worth it. I've, I'm so stressed out a lot of the times. Um, I cry a lot. You know, um, I'm poor. There's no money in this, like we had said. Um, but, you know, in the, at the end of the day, um, we're changing lives. Mm-hmm. And I've had women that, you know, they they go to church, like I said, with me, and they've never even been inside of a church, or, you know, they get saved mm-hmm. for the first time. And that's tremendous to me. That's, that's really, that makes it all worth it. All right. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Leanne, what about you? Is, has, it, has it been worth it? Uh, you know, I like what C.C. Winan says. She said, it may not be easy, but it is worth it. When we get to heaven, we're going to see many of those that we have had an impact on. And that's going to be my, that's my goal. I, You know, I'm not in this for anything else, but to see women changed and to see their lives, you know, be productive, to see their families back together. One of the greatest things, Mike, I ever seen was uh, one of the ladies from ORW. She got out. She was with us for a year. She was fighting to get her children back. And after she graduated from our program and she got a home, one Sunday I looked back uh, at church and there she sat with all five of her children in church. You talk about somebody ecstatic. I was ecstatic because that let me know that that woman had truly changed, you know, truly. Or to have this Sunday, I have the privilege as I am a pastor outside of here. One of the women that was at ORW that God has totally changed her life, will be speaking at our church. God has called her into the ministry. And he said, you be the first door that opens to her. So this Sunday, she will be preaching. I feel like her mama, you know, excited, you know, to be able to do this. So as long as we keep our excitement and our enthusiasm about what we're doing, God has promised us that we will be successful. All right. All right. Uh, Pastor Pardon, thank you. Uh, those are those are encouraging words. And, and you've reminded us to not grow weary and well doing right. for in due season, in due season. And uh, uh, as we as we get ready to conclude here, I, I promise to end on time. A lot of times I'm the I'm the guy that that comes late <laughs> and goes over time. But but I'm going to try to, to wrap up right on time so you can everybody can participate in these other uh, great offerings. But uh, uh, before we do, uh, uh, let me just ask you all if you just have a, a closing comment uh, for uh, those who are listening uh, virtually, for those who are at uh, the physical locations, uh, if you have just some closing thought about why we all need to care about housing and uh, uh, safe and stable housing for everybody. Mike, I just want to say this. If we give them stable housing, then they're not on the streets and they're not committing crime. That can, that makes everybody safer, the whole neighborhood. Sometimes people don't think about that. All right. All right. Yeah, there's there's a benefit in it for us too, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the neighborhood, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Chaplain Pardon? Remember that these folks that are coming uh, from incarceration and they're going through these programs, one day they could be your neighbor. So invest in them as you would want your neighbor to be. All right, all right. I think there's, I think there's a, a, a parable about uh, 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 being a good Samaritan. Mm-hmm. And at the end, at the end, I think uh, the Lord says, go and do likewise. Well, everybody, it's been a pleasure uh, uh, to be in this space with you. I wanna thank our, our panelists, Angela Regan and uh, Leanne Pardon. Thank you so much. Uh, God Thank bless you, each and every God. one of you. Enjoy the rest of today's session. Take care, everybody. Good seeing you guys.